Today we're going to pursue four animals. We're going to uh, meet experts who can tell us about four animals. We begin with uh, an extraordinary creature uh, mined in the water. So without further ado, if I could bring forward the author of The Dolphin in the Mirror, Diana Rees. Diana. Thank you so much, Moses, for inviting me here, and hello. In keeping with the theme of ideas having sex, what I want to talk to you today about is the C word, cetaceans. Cetaceans refers to whales, dolphins, and porpoises. There are 90 different species altogether, and they range from the majestic blue whale, the largest animal on the planet, to the bottlenose dolphins, the animals that I know and love. Those are the animal, the bottlenose dolphins are animals that I've worked with for over 25 years, and those are the animals I want to talk to you about today. Again, you can just look at the majesty of these animals. Bottlenose dolphin can't be more alien if you, th if, if you think about their body, these are truly non-terrestrials. They live a totally aquatic environment. They've evolved uh, in a way where their bodies have become completely streamlined for existence in the water. They don't even sleep like we sleep. Dolphins have two hemispheres like we do, but they never completely go to sleep. One hemisphere always has to stay conscious to keep them breathing. Their breathing is under voluntary control. They're not like us. We don't have to think to breathe. Dolphins do. Non-handed. They don't have hands, yet they're highly manipulative. They also, they also have a remarkable biosonar system where they can send out clicks of sound that sound something like this. You have to watch me, guys, because I love to imitate dolphin sounds. So they kind of sound like, ah, and they get these incredible acoustic pictures of the world. They have great vision, but they also can perceive things acoustically in murky waters or in the darkness. And uh, when you think about these dolphins, as different as they are from us, they're remarkably similar in so many ways. It's quite extraordinary. I've been working with them for about 30 years. And as, again, as different as they are in terms of their body, their morphology, they're strikingly similar to us in many ways. And I've had glimpses of these animals. I've met them up close and personal by my work in aquariums and also in the wild. And I've had glimpses of this rare kind of intelligence. And what I want to do today is I want to share glimpses of those animals with you. I want to tell you that there is someone in there. there we're people, but there are some ones in there. So again, I want to try to bring you a little bit into the world that I've seen today in this short amount of time. So in following with the C word, let's talk about complexity. Dolphins have complex brains. And these are large and complex brains, highly convoluted. They've got convolutions like our brains. They have large brains like we have. And uh, the brains of dolphins, again, we don't completely understand what they're doing with these brains yet. But their brains are larger, for example, that, to their body size than that of the great apes. So our brains are about seven, seven times the size they need to be to run our, our size body. The ape brains range from about 1.8 times the size to about 3.2 times the size they need to be to run their bodies. Dolphin brains are about 4.5 times the size they need to be. So they're larger than chimp brains relative to their bodies. But brains can only tell us one story, and it really is their behavior that's going to reveal more about the nature of their intelligence. So, Briefly, dolphins live in complex societies in the seas. These are 
These dolphins live in social groups that can be made up of hundreds of animals, some smaller subgroups of animals. They cooperate with each other, they rely on each other for their survival. They help each other in foraging, in mating behavior, in taking care of their young. Youngsters stay with the, the mothers uh, until they're at least four years old. So they have this long period of social learning. They learn their vocalizations. They learn the ways of dolphins. They also have complex communication, but in 50 years of trying to understand their communication, no one's cracked the code. It's something I've been incredibly interested in, trying to decode dolphin communication. And if you looked over my shoulder at my lab, you'd see something like this. Um, this is, these are what we call sonograms, that's sound pictures, and we're seeing sound frequency over time unraveling in front of our eyes. These are the sounds dolphins make in their interactions. Yet, we haven't, as I said before, been able to crack the code. Although we know that each dolphin has their own individual whistle that communicates who they are. We call them contact calls. This is what most animals on the planet do. But they've produced over, over 100 different signals. And in the years I've been studying them, we've tried to make a dolphin dictionary to understand the nature of these signals and how, to, how they're combined in sequences because they often produce really complex sequences. Again, this is a real question. What does it all mean? Now, in being frustrated about not being able to crack this code, I came up with another way of trying to look. And several years ago, I developed, with the help of Hewlett Packard, an underwater keyboard for dolphins. And you might say, what is she, nuts? They don't even have hands. How are they going to use a keyboard? But this keyboard allowed dolphins to touch these various keys with their beaks or their rostrums. And again, as I said, they're non-handed, but they're highly manipulative. And this is the way the keyboard worked. First of all, we gave dolphins choice and control. Big brain dolphins, highly social. What happens if we give them control over a keyboard? And the way it would work was they had a visual symbols on the board that you just saw. If they hit any of those symbols on the keyboard, and the symbols moved from position to position, they heard a special whistle that was associated with that key, and then they got an object. So if, if one of the dolphins like Delphi or Pan, the two, two of the dolphins I worked with, hit the triangle, they would hear a whistle like and they'd get a ball. Or if they hit an H shape, they would hear a different whistle and get a rub from us. So it was a giant vending machine, and they were in control. We had to provide what they asked for. And what was really fascinating, here's a piece that was produced for a show Nature. Here, Delphi and Pan were watching them underwater. They, they're hitting the keys. They're getting objects. But they did so much more than we expected. What they did was, on their own, they started to mimic or imitate the sounds they heard on the keyboard. And they imitate, not only did they imitate the sounds they heard, but they started to make associations without any help from us between the sounds, the objects they were receiving, and they started using them in their own interactions. So we were hearing them in the pool whistling ball while they were playing with the ball, or whistling ring while they were playing with the ring, and then we started getting exchanges between the dolphins with these elements. So this was terribly exciting. But again, we did this work in the 80s, and we barely could do it. Our technology barely, us allow, barely allowed us to do this. And many of you who were lucky enough to hear uh, Vincent, John Vincent yesterday talk about Jester Tech, we're hoping to use this very technology and partner with Jester Tech in the near future to try to create a state-of-the-art keyboard. Can you imagine a projection on an underwater screen of a dolphin pool with anything you can put on a computer screen available to the dolphin? It's going to be amazing. OK, hopefully I'll come back again and tell you more about that one. Well, dolphins are also highly creative. And several years ago, um, well, take a look at this picture. So we just talked about dolphins playing with balls and rings. You look at this beautiful silver ring, but this isn't something we gave the dolphin. They created this themselves. And when I, the day I got my first video camera many years ago, this is what I saw. This is a dolphin creating out of air these beautiful silver rings, blowing one a second one, and swimming through it. This is the first case we had of dolphins creating their own objects of play 
by blowing air out of their body, but, but from by themselves. They're not playing with ob man-made objects. These are dolphin-made objects. And in different facilities now, we've seen that dolphins uh, in different aquaria actually create objects of air. This is a, no a reflection of a non-terrestrial intelligence. Watch this dolphin as it blows this beautiful silver ring and the, out of their blowhole, that's their those, their nostrils at the top of their head, they have to understand how to keep this air ring underwater because again, air wants to rise. So they've mastered the art of blowing rings and they do them in many, many different ways. Now here's a young dolphin at the National Aquarium where I'm doing my research now. She's two years old, she's figured another way out. She kicks it with her tail to create a ring rather than blowing it out of her blowhole. Let's watch this one again. Watch her, she emits a little air, Put, runs her body through it and then kicks it with her tail. Two years old, human children don't do this kind of behavior, nor do chimps. It's fascinating what these animals are doing. Creativity, as well as culture, because once one animal starts, it passes through that group. And even when you have one dolphin in one facility moving to another facility, it becomes part of the culture in other facilities. And this is something that we're looking at. So creative and cultural, a couple more C words. Another C word, consciousness. We've heard a bit about that in this meeting. And dolphins, um, I can tell you, shares that aspect with us. So we look at our, our faces in the mirror and it's something that we see as a hallmark of our humanity, our intellect. We used to think we were the only species that could do this, that recognized our faces in the mirror. And mirror self-recognition is considered a hallmark of self-awareness. Self-awareness is multifaceted. Mirror self-recognition is one aspect of that. And human children, when human children start recognizing themselves when they're about 18 months to 24 months of age. And at this very time is also when we see evidence for the emergence of theory of mind, what we call theory of mind. This idea that we can empathize, we can put ourselves in the place of another. This happens just around this period and they seem to be inextricably linked. This idea of mere self-recognition, caring about what you look like, recognizing that face, that body in a mirror, being able to empathize with others and being able to put yourself in their plight, in their place. So mirror self-recognition until about 2001 when I did a study with dolphins was thought to be specifically a human ability and then uh, also shared with just our closest relatives, the great apes. But my colleague Laurie Marino and I showed at my laboratory in 2001 that dolphins also showed this ability. We did a series of very rigorous tests <laughs> speaks for itself. I don't even have to be up here saying anything about this. These animals uh, learn to understand that's their face <laughs> in the mirror. Right now I'm doing some extra other work at the National Aquarium trying to understand when does it start. So young kids again begin showing this at 18 to 24 months. Here are dolphins and they've already understood, they've already learned it's their face. They're really interested in doing things much like we do and like, the chi like chimps do. They look at their eyes close up. They like to look in the insides of their mouth, at their genitals. They watch themselves performing behaviors, blowing bubbles, doing different kinds of bubble, bubbling, uh, doing different kinds of postures at the mirror. And this is a one and a half year old <laughs> looking inside his mouth. Blowing bubbles, watching himself in silence. They do not vocalize at the mirror. They do not show social behaviors at the mirror. Here's a one, another one and a half year old, little Bailey. Just watch, it speaks for itself. We're looking through a two-way mirror in these images, watching herself. This is a conscious, sentient animal. They all, dolphins are known to be empathic. They ha we believe they have theory of mind. It's something we're exploring right now in more depth. Now this brings me to one of my last C words and unfortunately this is a rather, rather tragic situation. The word is cove and the word cove stands for a small cove in Taiji, Japan um, where dolphins are slaughtered annually in the drive hunts. Um, thousands of animals from September through April 
are herded into this cove where they are slaughtered in front of each other. Uh, the cove was shown in a film, many of you may have heard of the film, The Cove. It won the Oscar in 2009. And I actually met the director, Louis Sahoyas, in 2005 when I was giving a talk at a marine mammal conference. And I told him about this cove. I had been trying to work to, with the Japanese government to convince them that these are highly sentient, highly conscious animals that need protection that shouldn't be slaughtered. And our, my, my cries and the cries of my colleagues saying, let's use science to change policy fell upon deaf ears when we tried to make changes. And fortunately, I met Luis Hoyas, told him about the cove, and the rest was history. I got a call from him several months later, and he said, Diana, I'm on my way to Japan. We're making the film. So this film brought public awareness. Thanks. And I must say, I have to thank Louis and his team. They're extraordinary heroes in every sense of the word to do this. They really risk their lives. I'm going to warn you now, I'm going to show you some graphic footage that Louis provided from the cove. And here you're seeing the dolphins being herded. Again, it's very graphic. I warn you ahead of time. These are dolphins that we just saw looking at themselves in mirrors, using keyboards, dolphins that are conscious, dolphins that are aware of each other and their plight, being bludgeoned, being harpooned. and. You cannot treat laboratory animals like this. If you're a mouse, you cannot kill a mouse like this. So these are dolphins. I'm just going to let you watch this footage for a moment. Every bit of this is a horror story for dolphins. From being herded in to, being, to watching others in their social group being killed. These are animals that are aware, that can feel pain and suffering. My final word is cosmopolitan, my final C word for the day. And what this refers to is, a, well, actually, cosmo, cosmopolitan was actually a term first coined back in the fourth century by Diogenes, the Greek philosopher, that refers to the idea of being a citizen of the world. You are the ultimate cosmopolitan group. We are citizens of this world, of this planet. And with this, I think, comes the responsibility to act ethically and responsibility and let our science drive our global policy. Science transcends geographic boundaries. And we know enough to say, we know enough to say about dolphins and whales. They need global protection, not just protection in one country or another, but global protection. So I call on all of you as cosmopolitans, as citizens of the world, to speak out, speak to your friends. Most of you probably know people in Japan. You do business with associates in Japan. Let them know that you care. I think every voice can matter here. Every voice can count. Dolphins are empathic. We are too. And again, I call on you. My last C word is a call, a call for action, a call to join with me and my colleagues to try to bring an end to this by each and every one of you speaking out about this and say, stop, these animals need protection. And I'm at zero, so I thank you so much.